Hello, welcome back to PCC 25. Uh, I'm here with Karen Petersburg, uh, Vice President of Data Center Construction and Development at American Real Estate Partners. Um, Karen, it's quite late in the day at PTC here. I only just remembered that job title and, uh, <laughs> and firm name. But um, yeah, how's the event been for you so far? Oh, it's, it's been really, really good. We've had a lot of really good meetings. It's been real successful. It's been exhausting. I'm, I'm tired, but uh, yeah. it's been fun. We're all tired, yeah. but we're all having a great time. Yes, 100%. <laughs> you can't have a bad time in Hawaii. I was Very talking much. to my husband, Even and I was, he's like, I said, number one rule, you're not allowed to complain when you're in Hawaii. I'm like, all right, cool. Very true. Even the rain this morning, I think That's everyone's right. spirits are still up, um, which is great to see. But yeah, so for, for our viewers who are um, less familiar, why don't you just kind of quickly start off by explaining exactly what American Real Estate Partners is? Sure. Do. Yeah, so Powerhouse Data Centers is, one, is a wholly owned subsidiary of American Real Estate Partners. American Real Estate Partners has been in business for about 22 years right now. And then Powerhouse, that vertical, has been around four, four or five years. Mm -hmm. And so we've got right now about 60 buildings um, planned or in process of being developed, which is, equates to about 5.8 gigawatts of power. Our, port, our platform and what our core product is a powered shell, but we can also do turnkey for customers. Um, we build shells specifically for AI use cases, hyperscale data centers and the like. Um, right now we're at PTC. Um, just telling everybody we've got 10 active sites that we control that have power line of sight with signed documents and we own that own that land the right. campuses range from about 200 megawatts to 1.2 gigawatts per campus and power delivery ranges from 2026 to around 2028 in some cases it lags a little bit further so in terms of of what we're doing and the timeliness of it it seems like things are are going really well for us yeah. Well, I think like a big, um, you know, big kind of like theme of, uh, you know, the construction side of the industry. Um, it's, it's, well, especially in uh, in Europe, maybe in, in the US as well. Maybe you can kind of give us a little bit of an insight there. Is um, around, yeah, how can we make these buildings more sustainable? Um, there's a lot of regulations coming out. I know in like the EU side of things that we've covered. Um, is that kind of something that you're seeing in the U.S. as well? Oh, 100%. You know, California, as usual, kind of spearheads what the regu the regulatory side mm -hmm. of sustainability in the U.S. And, you know, all the other markets sort of lag a little bit behind. So we always look to California to give us some insight right. of, of where the trends are going to be and how to future-proof when we think through how we design our data centers. And specifically on the sustainability side, at Powerhouse, we like to look at the whole building. We're, we're, we consider ourselves sustainable developers, and so we want to think about the building not just as a, a short period asset, but look at it as, as a, through the life cycle of the project. So we pay attention to building envelope and um, other things like building resiliency. So we look at the market condition, or the climate conditions in the different regions, and make sure we future proof our buildings just to outlast any of these specific terrainal um, issues that could come up. We're very mindful of just making sure the building's as efficient as possible. So the envelope itself and how that how that translates into the tenant's requirements, because it is kind of interesting. When the tenant comes in, you have to build the, the shell of the building a certain way, and so you have to make sure that your shell is not going to compete with what the building, the, the MEP infrastructure is going to do. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're not as efficient as you could be. So there's a, a give and a play and a gimme and a conversation that has to happen. Um, we also do, uh, well, we do life cycle assessments, like that's typical usually, but we also do something called the um, Nature Place, which is based on the AIA uh, framework of excellence. And that really looks at the local community. It looks at all of the different aspects of what's important to the local community. And we use that to inform our design. So in Reno, for example, we had, um, it's very scarce. It, the water is very scarce in Reno. And you actually have to buy water right. So it's not like you can just take the water and use it. Every little raindrop is accounted for and you have to purchase it. Right. And so we purchased the water ahead of time, but knowing that it's such a scarce commodity, part of the, the requirements of the local jurisdiction was to have landscaping. But every single landscaping out in Reno requires water. So we actually had a conversation with them and, and requested zero scaping, which was using the native rock that we blasted to uh, put strategically, beautifully, around the land, <laughs> and it, we've turned it into That's sort of a, 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 a zen garden, a, a relaxation garden mm -hmm. type of thing, and they were they were fine with that, so we were able to go with no water use for irrigation. So right. we think of That's these really things as we, 
as yeah. we enter into these markets. So it's like, yeah, thinking of the project as a whole and like looking like kind of like, how can we reuse things? Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, well, you mentioned kind of like, you know, Powerhouse building a lot of kind of like AI ready facilities now as well. Um, how has that kind of like changed thing from a building construction standpoint? Like, um, what do you have to like bear in mind if you know this data sensor is going to have like AI workplace housed within it compared yeah. to something for cloud or like a co-location? No, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, the, the densities of the cabinets are going up considerably. Like we saw before, it was four, by four uh, kilowatts of a rack. Now we're seeing 12 to 14 for cloud users. But in AI use cases, you're looking at 70 up to 200, 300 kilowatts yeah. per rack, depending on the, the, the chip that they're planning on deploying. And so in order to build a, a future-proof design based on that, we don't really know what the weight requirements are going to be for these racks. It's kind of tough, right? And then you don't know also, you don't know what the cooling requirements are going to need to be for these high-density chips. So future-proofing becomes a little bit of a, a game there on and how best to do that. So you just have to think through, I guess, I, I always think about it like you think through even further along than what you're seeing coming down the pike. So that way you're yeah. always trying to talk through what that looks like with your suppliers and and these technical folks that are actually building the liquid cooling and everything that yeah. goes along with it. That makes sense. Can you give us any like examples of um, how a AI ready building might differ from like a cloud one? Well, the, the difference really right now is just in structural loading requirements. We try to make sure that our structural loading is handling these heavy racks and then we have to future proof li liquid cooling, making mm -hmm. sure that we have, if they go with as a, well, I'll say this, as a sustainable developer, we like to go with evaporative closed loop systems if they do use water and not do open loop systems just because it's a, a drain in our, our natural resources, right? Yeah. So that said, when we do buy land, we are always asking the utility providers, you know, what's the max capacity of water you have available? What does that look like? Because certain customers do require open loop systems, and so we need to be mindful of that. And so it's just paying attention to the power needs and the water needs of what these customers could could have so that when they come to the site we're we're ready to discuss you know what what we can do as options there yeah that makes sense um how, how are things from kind of like a supply chain uh side for you guys so like obviously you know it's no secret like a load of new data centers are being built like larger campuses than ever before um like kind of like newer designs yes. new materials um is there any kind of like issues that you've experienced there? As yeah, well? so we haven't directly experienced any issues. We, we do keep an open line of communication with all of our partners. So we have an understanding of where the production slots are, where things are going. That said, labor itself, everyone knows, is a problem. And yeah. as we talk about these gigawatt campuses and remote locations, the people aren't there, at least the skilled labor is not there. And so mm -hmm. we look at man camps, bringing people in. We look at what does training need to look like so that we can get these local local farmers or whoever it is up to have the skills that they need to then become data center operators or you know right. people that can actually come into the data center and, and work in it. So always having this idea of what workforce development can be so that we can we can solve that labor shortage problem as we go through the process. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Karen, thank you very much You're for welcome. chatting with us. Yeah. Uh, it's been great. Yeah, it's so fun. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, thank you to everyone uh, watching at home as well. Um, remember to check out thetechcapital.com for more news, views, and industry insights.